Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I know that Dr. Watson will agree with me when I tell you that the best way to begin a good meal is with a glass of Petri California Sherry. Before you sit down at the table, pour yourself and your family a glass of Petri Sherry. Try it. There are many ways to tell a good wine by its color, its aroma, and its flavor. On every count, Petri Sherry is outstanding. The color of Petri Sherry is a clear, deep amber. Perfect. The aroma? Well, Petri Sherry is as fragrant as a bunch of dew-covered grapes picked in the early morning. But most important to you, and to me, is the flavor of Petri Sherry. We want a wine that tastes good. And believe me, you couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Petri Sherry. And just to make sure you get a wine that's exactly the way you want it, Petri makes two kinds of sherry. The regular and Petri Pale Dry. If you're not sure which you like better, why not try them both? Don't buy one, buy two. Just be sure you always buy Petri. Petri Sherry. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Marjo. Quiet, quiet, quiet. I don't want it. <laughs> Dogs seem very chipper tonight, Doctor. Have they been getting into any more trouble lately? Oh, no, my boy. It's been a relatively quiet week for them. One meeting with a dead seal, two visits to my neighbor's chickens, and a losing battle today with a cross-eyed Siamese cat. <laughs> you, you call that a quiet week, huh? Oh, it is for them, but never mind about the dogs. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. You're just in time to join me in a, in a glass of sherry. That'll be very nice, Doctor. Oh, I see you have the old dispatch box out again. Yes, my boy. As the story I'm going to tell you tonight took place in 1887, I thought I'd better refresh my memory on some of the details of the case. But shortly after my marriage, and as I'd bought a practice in the Paddington district, I saw very little of my old friend Sherlock Holmes. How was doctoring in those early days? A struggle, my boy, a distinct struggle. Dr. Farquhar, from whom I had bought the practice, had at one time an excellent clientele, but his age, combined with an unfortunate affliction, the year that resembled St. Vitus's dance, uh, had very much thinned it. I had a uh, uh, conference, however, in my, in my youth and in my energy, and I was convinced that in a very few years the practice would be as flourishing as ever. But, as I said, I saw very little of Holmes in those days. I guess you were too busy to visit Baker Street, aren't I? Yeah, you guessed quite correctly, Mr. Bartow, quite correctly. Uh, Holmes seldom went anywhere himself save on professional business. You can imagine my surprise, therefore, when one day on coming home from a heavy day's work, I found that Holmes had decided to pay us a visit. My wife persuaded him to stay to dinner, and as the three of us sat at the table, the flickering candlelight dancing strange patterns on the walls, they did quite like old times. Holmes was in an unusually gay mood, and I can remember the twinkle in his eye as he turned to my wife and said, You're a brave woman, Mrs. Watson, to beat an unexpected guest on the maiden night out. I'm extremely grateful. Mrs. Hudson's cooking, though excellent of its kind, lacks variety. Uh, your dinner has been quite a treat. <laughs> That's a very gracious little speech, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> I've never known you to be so observant about food, Holmes. Oh, oh, oh. Perhaps the lack of your company, my dear chap, and the consequent lonely meals have made me conscious of Mrs. Hudson's culinary shortcomings. Uh, I, um, I suppose you're taking John out with you tonight on one of your cases. Oh, no, Mrs. Watson. Now I can understand your suspicions. My visit was purely social. Then well, let's go into the other room and, and have a pipe, shall we? Well, uh, don't you think you'd be more comfortable at the club? <laughs> so, Mary, I believe you want to get rid of us. Oh, <laughs> no, dear, it's not that. It's just that... Uh, that um, well, your visitor is due at any moment and you would count it on the house being empty by now. Why, how on earth did you know that, Mr. <laughs> Holmes? Past half hour, you've been glancing at the clock with mounting anxiety. I feel sure that... Um, 
If it had been, if it had not been for my unexpected visit, your, uh, your good husband would already have been walking towards his club. Yeah, it is my custom to go to the club on Thursdays, but, uh, but how do you know? <laughs> I know your habits, my dear chap. As well, if not better than you do. It's a, it's a good thing I'm a bachelor, isn't it, Mrs. Watson? Yes, indeed. A wife will keep no secrets from you, Mr. Holmes, I'm sure. Uh, well, Mary dear, who, who is your visitor, and uh, what is the secret that you, you've been hiding? <laughs> It's innocent enough, John. As Thursdays is the maid's night out and you've been going to the club, I've been letting Alicia Wentworth meet her young man here. With me, a chaperone, of course. Oh, so that's the mystery. Well, Watson, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, love is on the wing and I'm sure we're dreadfully in the way. Let's uh, stroll to Baker Street, shall we? Well, of course, I'll get my coat. Uh, why didn't you tell me, man? Eh? Well, I was afraid you might be angry, John. Angry, of course, ma'am. Alicia is such a sweet girl. And Harry Prendergast is a very charming young man. He comes from an excellent family, has a commission in the infantry, and the children are tremendously in love. But her beastly guardian forbids them to meet. So I... Oh, there she is now. Well, we can pretend that we were just leaving anyway. Yes, I'll get my coat. Hello, Alicia, dear. Oh, Mrs. Watson, I'm so glad to see you. Come here. Alicia, this is my husband. And Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, my dear? It's a shame that we have to go now, but my friend and I have some very important business to attend to. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective, aren't you? Yes, Miss Whitworth. Please don't go, Mr. Holmes. Please don't. I need help so badly. Why, Alicia, what's wrong? You're as white as a ghost. Let's go into the drawing room, shall we? What's troubling you, Miss Wentworth? It's Harry, Captain Prendergast. I don't know exactly what's the matter, but something dreadful has happened to him. Oh, now sit down here beside me, dear. That's it. Miss Wentworth, uh, what reason do you have to suppose that Captain Prendergast is in trouble? I've seen friends of his today. They spoke of him almost as if he were dead. And yet they wouldn't tell me why. And just now I went to his club. And they told me that Captain Prendergast was not a member. But he is a member. He's been a member for years. Oh, what's happened to it? What has happened to it? Yes, there, dear. Mr. Holmes will help you. Now, don't you cry. Have you uh, been to the police, Miss Wentworth? No, Doctor. You see, I went to my guardian, but he wouldn't let me go to the police. He said there'd be a scandal. But then he hates her. The Pentecosts are a fine family. Uh, why does your guardian object to, uh, object, uh, object to him so strongly? I don't think he would approve of anyone I choose. He doesn't want me to get married. Oh, sounds like a positive ogre to me. Uh, who, who is your guardian, my dear? Colonel Moran. Colonel Sebastian Moran. Indeed. He's a man who has many entries against him in my ledgers, but a man that I've never met. I have long hoped to cross swords with him directly. But, but how could Uncle Sebastian have anything to do with the criminal profession, Mr. Holmes? He's a son of Sir August Moran. He was once British minister to Persia. Oh, oh you must be confusing him with someone else. Uh, no, my dear, it's the same man. And furthermore, I'm almost certain that your guardian is the right-hand man of a certain friend of mine whose name also begins with the three letters M-O-R. Good Lord, Moriarty. I have no proof. And yet I suspect that Colonel Moran is the second most dangerous man in London. That's Harry. It must be Harry. Oh, poor girl. I do hope you can help her, Mr. Holmes. I shall do my best, Mrs. Well, Watson. that is her young man at the door, it's more than likely her problem doesn't exist any longer. I hope you're right, Watson. Though with Colonel Moran as a guardian, I'm afraid the young lady is destined to have trouble. Come on, Harry. Good evening, Mrs. Watson. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Harry. Uh, this is my husband. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, my boy? And Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Captain Prendergast? How do you do, sir? Harry, what's wrong? I can tell by your face that something dreadful has happened. It has, darling. Tell Mr. Holmes about it. He's promised to help us. Well, sir, I'm afraid this is a little outside of your province. <laughs> you will find that my friend's province is quite extensive, Captain Prendergast. I would be more than happy to do anything I can to help, sir. That's very nice of you, Mr. Holmes. Well, it's pretty bad. Last night I was accused of cheating at cards at the Tankerville Club. Oh, dreadful. Of course, I don't have to tell you that I didn't cheat, but the evidence was dead against me. I'd been winning heavily, and the cards were proved to be marked. Marked? How? There were pinpricks on the edges. Pinpricks which indicated the card's value. Hmm. How did the pack of cards come into play? That's the devil of it. I myself broke open a sealed pack given to me by the club porter. And I swear, that was the pack that was later found to be marked. Was everyone searched? Yes. But they found a new, unopened pack in my pocket. The obvious implication being that you had substituted the marked cards, of course. I can see what happened. Somebody deliberately tried to incriminate you by dropping the new pack in your pocket. Of course, darling. But what I can't understand is how the marked pack was introduced into the game. Were there any other cards found in the room? None, Doctor. The Tankerville, eh? Colonel Moran is a member of the club, isn't he? Yes, he is. Uncle Sebastian uses it all the time. He was present at the game last night, Alicia. Oh, Harry. Now we're worse off than ever. 
If he thinks you cheated at cards, he'll never let us get married. Now, don't worry, Alicia. I'm sure that Mr. Holmes can find a way out of this. I'm afraid it'll be too late. I couldn't marry you now, Alicia. What do you mean, Harry? But they forced me to resign from the club. That's a bad enough disgrace. But I know there's worse to come. You see, I was expecting my promotion to major any day. Now it'll be a miracle if I'm not cashiered from the regiment. What kind of a life can I offer you? Harry, you're talking absolute nonsense. I think, Captain Prendergast, the next step is obvious. We must remove this apparent stain on your character. But how? Miss Wentworth can stay here with Mrs. Watson. The doctor and I will drive over in a cab with you to the club and see what can be done. What kind of a, a card game were you playing last night, Prendergast? Stud poker. Ever since the American ambassador introduced it at the club, it's been quite a favorite. The perfect game for marked cards. It requires no elaborate dexterity in the dealings, simply the knowledge of your opponent's whole card. How many of you were playing? Half a dozen of us. Uh, you, uh, you were winning heavily, you say? Yes, Doctor. Though one of the others, a fellow named David Harkness, was doing well. Now I come to think of it, Harkness almost seemed to know when I was bluffing. As though he could see the marked card. Well, perhaps he was the one who marked them. It's possible. And yet certainly no one could accuse him of tricky dealing. He was so clumsy with his bandaged finger, eh? How did you know he had a bandaged finger, Mr. I'll Holmes? tell you that, Captain Prendergast, when you tell me what's really on your mind. There's a great deal more at stake than a card scandal, isn't there? Yes, there is. I didn't dare to tell Alicia about it. You see, I'm fighting a duel tomorrow. A duel? Lord, with whom? Colonel Moran. Huh? He insulted me last night. He goaded me beyond a man's patience. He taunted me until I couldn't stand it any longer. And so I challenged him. And in so doing, gave him the choice of weapons. Yes, could have found it. Of course, he chose revolvers. Moran was a big game hunter of note. He was reputed to be the best shot in England. And I'm probably the worst in London. If only I could shoot as well as I can box. I'm regimental champion, you know. Revolvers? Good heavens, man. Revolvers, a, a duel with Moran is, is suicide for you. No, it's not suicide. Ah, Thank you, those club. Here, cabby. Keep the change, will you? Oh, blimey. Thank you, Governor. Suicide. No, what's not suicide. This is a carefully laid plan for murder. Pray heaven that we are not too late to avert it. that you want him, sir? Yes, he... He went to his room half an hour ago. Number 108. Up the main stairs and down the corridor, sir. Thank you. I, um, want you to follow us in precisely one minute and bring a sealed pack of the club's playing cards to Mr. Harkness's room. Do you understand? Oh, yes, sir. And thank you. Did you, uh, Did you make the arrangement? Yes, come on. Let's go up to Harkness's room. The three members have cut me dead since I came in here. It's the most humiliating experience. A little patience, Captain Prendergast, and I'm sure your honor will be entirely vindicated. I wish I knew what you were up to, Holmes. I'm going to try and restage the drama that was presented in this club last night. The only difference being that my production is a lot of cast that's a little different. Now, here we are. Now, let me do the talking. Yes? Did you want something? Prendergast, I don't want you in my rooms. I don't know why they allowed you inside the club. Let us in, Mr. Harkness, please. No, I won't. Take your foot out of the door, confound you. Uh, Mr. Harkness, there are three of us. <clears throat> I think you'd better let us in. You're going to let us in, Harkness. Oh, all right. Come in. Ah, oh, thank you for your hospitality, sir. Now perhaps you fellows will tell me what the devil you think you're up to. With pleasure. As you very well know, Mr. Harkness, this is probably Captain Prendergast. Last day on Earth. He has one request to make of you. That you join him in a farewell game of poker with us. To show you bear no grudges. Oh, it's fantastic. You're all insane. Oh, by the way, Mr. Harkness, I'm delighted to notice that your sore finger seems to have healed with great rapidity. By an odd coincidence, you'll observe that uh, I seem to have injured my... Well, when did you do that? Oh, in the carriage just now. A mere scratch. Fortunately, I had some first aid materials in my greatcoat. Come in. Yes, Taylor, what is it? Begging your pardon, Mr. Harkness, but the gentleman asked me to bring this sealed pack of cards here. Uh, put them on the table, Taylor. Very good, sir. Well, what's up?
What's the game? Stud poker, Mr. Harkness. A game with which you're quite familiar, I understand. And the stakes? A man's honor. Possibly another man's freedom. Open the pack, Mr. Harkness, and deal us all a hand. I should think this might be a very unusual game. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Time for me to explain that Petri California Sherry is not only an ideal wine to serve before dinner, but it's also the perfect wine for almost any occasion. Petri Sherry is fine after dinner, when you're listening to the radio or just sitting around talking. And, of course, you couldn't ask for a finer party wine than Petri Sherry, especially if your party is at cocktail time. If you don't know what wine to buy... You can't go wrong with Petri Sherry, but be sure it's Petri. Look for the letters P-E-T-R-I. They spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. Dr. Watson, that was quite a game of poker you were settling down to. Uh, I have a feeling that Sherlock Holmes had an ace or two up his sleeve, didn't he? Well, figuratively, he did, Mr. Bartell. Though at the time, I must confess that, as usual, I was pretty much in the dark. David Harkness opened the new sealed pack of cards, and the four of us played a hand of poker. It was easy to see that our unwilling host was far from happy. His ferrety eyes darted from one to the other of us as he played our cards. (coughs) He knew that he was the victim of a conspiracy, and so he was watching every move we made. Finally, as that strange game progressed, Captain Prendergast leaned across the table and said, I think you're bluffing, Harkness. Do you? Well, it'll cost you exactly the limit to find out. How curious are you? Major, I think you are bluffing, Harkness. I'll see you. You'd be a fool to Watson when he has a straight flush. What do you mean, Holmes? My dear Harkness, the markings are quite apparent, I assure you, to someone who knows what he's looking for. Scott, you mean that these cards are marked too? Examine them for yourself, old chap. They are marked. They're pinpricked just like they were last night. Well, that's impossible. Harkness broke the seals on you pack just now. We all saw him do it. He couldn't have switched the pack. And why would I do that, even if I could? I wouldn't try and cheat Mr. Sherlock Holmes, would I? No, Mr. Harkness. I just wanted you to know that I understood the trick. What trick, Mr. Holmes? The same one that was played on you last night, Captain Prendergast. This was a demonstration of how easily a sealed pack of cards may be turned into a marked one by a man with a sore finger. What has a sore finger got to do with it, Holmes? Oh, it's very simple, Watson. A pinhead or a thumbtack. Hidden under the bandage, a tiny pressure against a card one wishes to mark as it comes into one's hand, and after several deals... (laughs) Hey, presto, a marked pack. Oh, so that's how it was done. You can't prove it, Holmes. You can't prove a thing. You weren't here last night. Oh, unfortunately, I wasn't, Mr. Harkness. Otherwise, I should have had the great pleasure of exposing your trick at the time. As it is, I shall have to rely on a public confession. (laughs) You'll never get a confession from me. Possibly not, but I'm sure that you'll be interested to know... But I've made quite an extensive study of card shopping. In fact, I've considered giving a little lecture or demonstration here at the club. What are you talking about? This game that we've just played was in the nature of a rehearsal. I should, of course, stress this particular method as being of uh, great local interest. I'm sure most of the gambling members will recall one man who has had uh, unusually bad luck with his fingers. Holmes? You're trying to ruin me. Well, you were willing to see Prendergast ruin. And killed. But a pistol duel with Colonel Moran is almost equivalent to murder. What? What do you want me to do? Uh, from the direction of your glance, Mr. Harkness, I'm certain that you keep a loaded revolver in your desk drawer. That's a very poor solution, I assure you. Why not be a man, write a confession and sign it? It'll free Captain Prendergast from any stigma and it'll... Help to trap the real culprit, Colonel Sebastian Moran. Moran? Where does he come into the picture, Holmes? Mr. Harkness knows, don't you? And I think I know now. Why don't you tell us, Harkness? One thing at a time, Pendergast. I owe it to you to write a confession. I'll do that. Rather than face a public exposure in the club, but that's as far as I'll go. If you have any ideas about Moran, go and talk to him yourselves. There's a certain honor, you know. Even among thieves? Thank you for the implication, Mr. Harkness. You have writing materials here? Yes, I have writing materials, Holmes. Splendid. Then while you're telling the truth about last night's episode, we'll call on Colonel Sebastian Moran. Have you any idea where we might find him at this time of night? Yes, I have every idea. You'll find him in the gun room. Thinks he has a jewel on his hands tomorrow. In the gun room, eh? Thank you, Mr. Harkness. We'll go and talk to him. You may expect us back within half an hour. <laughs> Who 
Who are you fellows? Hmm. Turn the gas up, can't you? Colonel Moran, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, Colonel Moran, I've been wanting to meet you for a very long time. Sherlock Holmes, hmm. I've heard a lot about you. And I have you, Colonel. Harry, what are you doing inside the club? Mr. Holmes brought me back. We've just left David Harkness's room. He's writing a confession that he engineered the swindle last night. That he deliberately tried to involve me. So... In that case, I suppose I need oil this revolver no longer. Harkness is a cheat. Dear me, how shocking. Aren't you glad that my name will be cleared in this business? Of course I am. I'm delighted. And you'll apologize for the things that you said last night? Yes, Harry, I'll apologize. But you must realize that this revelation makes no difference to my feelings about your marriage to Alicia. On my soul, Colonel Moran, it seems to me that one Dr. Went... Uh, uh, Watson, I think the name is. Watson, yes, my name's Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson... I would suggest that the happiness of my ward is a matter that cannot possibly concern you. Now, look here, sir. I, I don't want to go... Will you, old chap? Oh, sorry. Uh, Colonel Moran, I think I may be able to change your mind on the question of your ward's marriage. How very interesting. And what makes you labor under that delusion? Would you care to have it known at the club that you had deliberately planned Captain Prendergast's murder? What in thunder are you talking about? You know, sir, that a revolver duel with you is no duel. It's a cold-blooded killing. Rubbish. I was challenged. Therefore, I had the choice of weapons. Actually, I chose the weapon with which I was most familiar. And you had the choice for a very good reason, Colonel Moran. You forced Friendly Gast into a duel because it was the only way you, you could be certain that he'd never marry your ward. Alicia? What do you know about her? More than you think, sir. She's at my wife's house this very minute. As she suspects you of jealousy. I think it's far more likely that the financial aspect of guardianship is involved here. A financial accounting is due upon her marriage, isn't it? That's none of your business. An accounting is due, Mr. Holmes. Alicia told me that herself. Exactly, and the accounts were in no state to undergo scrutiny. The answer is obvious. David Hartness, a card shop, was in need of money. You induced him to practice his cheating last night in order that you could trap Captain Prendergast into a duel. <clears throat> Harkness, what the devil do you want? Put that revolver down, you fool. I don't care about my own disgrace, but you're going to pay for your share in it, Moran. Drop that revolver, Harkness. Don't you see that you're... Oh, oh. Moran, you... You shot him. You saw that it was in self-defense, gentlemen. He was waving a loaded revolver at me. It's most unfortunate, but it was in self-defense. Yes, self-defense that removed the one dangerous witness who could have testified against you. He's dead, Watson, isn't he? Yes. Shot right through the heart. Moran, you're a cold-blooded, murdering devil. I demand satisfaction for that insult. These gentlemen are my witnesses. I apologize for the misunderstanding last night, but this is a different matter. You've insulted me, Harry. The duel will take place, Colonel Moran, and Dr. Watson and myself will act as seconds for Captain Prendergast. Let's make the necessary arrangements, shall we? <laughs> Watson? Yes, Alicia, dear. It's two o'clock. What can have happened to them? They left here just after eight. Oh, well, if, if you'd been married to John for any length of time, my dear, you wouldn't worry. When your husband goes out with Sherlock Holmes, you're prepared not to see him for a few days. Mrs. Watson, what are you saying? I haven't got a husband. Hmm? Oh. Oh, now, Alicia, don't, don't glower at me like that. What did you say the time was? It's just after two, and they left here at eight. What can have happened? Well, I don't know. But Mr. Holmes was with them. So don't worry, my dear. He's frightfully clever. I wouldn't be surprised. There's the front door now. They're back. Oh, dear me. Now I'll have to make Coco. Harry! Harry, darling, what's happened? Oh, lots of things, darling. I'm a member of the Tankerville Club again. I'll probably become a major... And you'll certainly become Mrs. Prendergast before very long. Oh, it all sounds wonderful. What have you two been up to? Oh, it's the old story, Mary, dear. Holmes solved the case and it all ended happily. Happily? My dear Watson, that's hardly the word to use. Harkness is dead and Colonel Moran is probably in hospital. Please, tell me what happened. <laughs> well, your, your guardian challenged Captain Prendergast to a duel. Um, he overlooked the fact that uh, since he was the challenger, the choice of weapons belonged to his opponent. And perhaps you can guess what the choice was. Boxing gloves. We've just come from the gymnasium at the club, Alicia. I'm afraid I really gave him a thrashing. Uh -huh. 
And a well-deserved one, too. I'm only sorry that I couldn't put him where he belongs, behind prison bars. Oh, Harry. He'll be the laughing stock of London. I'm glad of it. But, but that means that he'll never consent to our being married. I disagree, Miss Wentworth. If we keep his secret, and we've hinted that we might, I'm quite certain that he'll withdraw his objections to the marriage, and somehow he'll make up his deficiencies in his guardianship account. Probably by borrowing money from Professor Moriarty. Oh, oh I think it's all wonderful. But it's well after two o'clock in the morning. Let's go into the kitchen, shall we? I'll make some cocoa. Cocoa? Oh, no. For a whiskey. Oh, Harry, huh? you and Alicia stay here. You probably have some plans to make. Oh, cocoa's not a very exciting drink. Oh, it? shush, John. Oh, sorry. No. As soon as the cocoa's ready, we'll call you. <laughs> Doctor, that was, that was some story. You know, I'm glad the age of dueling is over. I'd hate to have someone challenge me to a duel. What's the matter, Mr. Bartell? Are you afraid of being uh, hurt? Afraid of being hurt? Of course not. If someone challenges me to a duel, I, I have the right to choose the weapons, don't I? Yes, and what weapons would you choose? Cream puffs at 30 paces. Nobody's going to hurt me. <laughs> I see that. See that. <laughs> well, uh, come to think of it, Instead of cream puffs, I'd rather have a piece of cake. Oh, why a piece of cake? Because it tastes so good with a glass of Petri Sherry. Any questions? Uh, no questions. <laughs> For a while there, I'll bet you thought I'd forgotten all about Petri oh, wine. Oh, I've forgotten about it. Not you, Mr. Bartell. No, not anybody who's ever tasted it. it. Petri wine is the kind of wine you'll always remember. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. They've been making wine for generations. Winemaking is their heritage. It's an art that's been handed on down in the Petri family from father to son, from father to son. Every drop of Petri wine is clear, fragrant, and delicious. As delicious as the luscious, sun-ripened California grapes from which it's made. Remember, the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that their wine is the kind of wine you like for any occasion. You can't miss with Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, now, let me see. Uh, next week? Uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that took place in the gay Vienna of the 90s. Concerns a strange tragedy that occurred on a ballroom floor and a weird series of murders that were punctuated by the sound of music, I call the story The Waltz of Death. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story the Five Orange Pips. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week. Next week, many communities will change time, and this program will reach some of our listeners at a different hour. Consult your local newspaper or mutual station for the exact time in your area. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane... Followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Shepard and I, Doctor, have they been getting into any more trouble lately? No, oh, no, my boy. It's been a relatively quiet week for them. One meeting with a dead seal, two visits to my neighbor's chickens, and a losing battle today with a cross-eyed Siamese cat. <laughs> you, you call that a quiet week, eh? Oh, it is for them, but never mind about the dogs. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Oh, just in time to join me in a, in a glass of sherry. That'll be very nice, Doctor. 
Oh, I see you have the old dispatch box out again. Yes, my boy. As the story I'm going to tell you tonight took place in 1887, I thought I'd better refresh my memory on some of the details of the case. But shortly after my marriage, and as I had bought a practice in the Paddington district, I saw very little of my old friend Sherlock Holmes. How was doctoring in those early days? A struggle, my boy, a distinct struggle. Dr. Farquhar, from whom I had bought the practice, had at one time an excellent clientele, but his age, combined with an unfortunate affliction, he is at resenting, though excellent of its kind, lacks variety. Uh, your dinner has been quite a treat. <laughs> That's a very gracious little speech, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> yes, uh, I've never known you to be so observant about food, Holmes. <laughs> Perhaps the lack of your company, my dear chap, and the consequent lonely meals have made me conscious of Mrs. Hudson's culinary shortcomings. <laughs> uh, I, um... I suppose you're taking John out with you tonight on one of your cases. <laughs> oh, no, Mrs. Watson. Now I can understand your suspicions. My visit was purely social. Then let's go into the other room and, and have a pipe, shall we? Well, uh, don't you think you'd be more comfortable at the club? <laughs> so, Mary, I believe you want to get rid of us. Oh, no, dear, it's not that. It's just that... Uh, that um, well, your visitor is due at any moment and you would count it on the house being empty by now. Why, how on earth did you know that, Mr. Holmes? <laughs> past half hour, you've been glancing at the clock with mounting anxiety. I feel sure that, um, if it had been, if it had not been for my unexpected... Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I know that Dr. Watson will agree with me when I tell you that the best way to begin a good meal is with a glass of Petri California Sherry. Before you sit down at the table, pour yourself and your family a glass of Petri Sherry. Try it. There are many ways to tell a good wine by its color, its aroma, and its flavor. On every count, Petri Sherry is outstanding. The color of Petri Sherry is a clear, deep amber. Perfect. The aroma? Well, Petri Sherry is... is... Wilson Vax's dance uh, had very much thinned it. I had uh, a confidence, however, in my, in my youth and in my energy. And I was convinced that in a very few years, the practice would be as flourishing as ever. But, as I said, I saw very little of Holmes in those days. I guess you were too busy to visit Baker Street, aren't I? Yeah, you guessed quite correctly, Mr. Bartow, quite correctly. Uh, Holmes seldom went anywhere himself, save on professional business. You can imagine my surprise, therefore, when one day on coming home from a heavy day's work, I found that Holmes had decided to pay us a visit. My wife persuaded him to stay to dinner, and as the three of us sat at the table, the flickering candlelight dancing strange patterns on the walls, Fed it quite like old times. Holmes was in an unusually gay mood, and I can remember the twinkle in his eye as he turned to my wife and said, You're a brave woman, Mrs. Watson, to feed an unexpected guest on the maiden night out. And I'm extremely grateful. Mrs. Hudson's cook's fragrant as a bunch of dew-covered grapes picked in the early morning. But most important to you, and to me, is the flavor of Petri Sherry. We want a wine that tastes good. And believe me, you couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Petri Sherry. And just to make sure you get a wine that's exactly the way you want it, Petri makes two kinds of sherry. The regular and Petri Pale Dry. If you're not sure which you like better, why not try them both? Don't buy one, buy two. Just be sure you always buy Petri. Petri Sherry. <laughs> And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him. Good evening, Dr. Good Watson. Good evening, Mr. Marshall. Uh, well, well, I don't want it. <laughs> Dogs seem very 